Well, the definition of ultra-fast reactions depends uh, when you were born, when you lived. Because in my time as an undergraduate, ultra-fast meant that processes were taking place on the millisecond time scale, thousandth of a second, or even longer than that. Most chemical reactions, photochemical reactions, occur on a much faster time scale than milliseconds. So in order to study them, you have to have a pulse of light to initiate a photochemical reaction, which is short compared with the time scale of the existence of the excited electronic states you're producing. George Porter, Nobel laureate in 1966, uh, developed a system called flash photolysis, which gave you these short pulses of light. And so he was able ultimately to extend the time scale of reactions to the microsecond time scale, a thousand times faster than had been easily available beforehand. But that wasn't uh, fast enough either because the, time, the lifetime of an excited singlet state is of the order of 10 to the minus 9 seconds, nanoseconds, or shorter. So you needed some way of getting a very short pulse of light on that sort of time scale. And with a, spark, with a discharge lamp, which is what conventionally had been used in flash photolysis, this is not possible. The physics of the discharge through a lamp meant that you always got a longer pulse of light than you needed. So what changed the whole scenario is the development of lasers in 1960 by Theodore Maiman. The, uh, the ruby laser was the first to come along. And then uh, the, the, the gas lasers, helium neon, argon iron, and then subsequently a whole host of others. And this allowed you to get uh, at first picosecond pulses of light, 10 to the minus 12 of a second, then femtosecond, 10 to the minus 15 of a second, and currently there are lasers in existence which give you attoseconds, 10 to the minus 18 of a second. Now chemistry really stops at around about 10 to the minus 13 of a second, uh, but we have the lasers available to study those re reactions occurring on that sort of time scale. You ask yourself the question, what do you want to know about a chemical reaction which requires you to have these, uh, these ultra-fast uh, uh, techniques available? Ideally, you want to know how quickly does the excited molecule relax down to other states, how quickly does it interact with other molecules? And uh, we can also then study the precise and exact details of those interactions, which leads to um, uh, the, the branch of the subject, which is called reaction dynamics. And there you are looking at individual molecules reacting with one with another, uh, rather than an assembly of molecules, a whole a large number of molecules, you can actually interrogate on a molecular, single molecular uh, scale. And that tells you in, in absolutely wonderfully intimate details about uh, the energy profile of molecules approaching one another, of the orientation in space of the molecules, uh, and so uh, what happens when the molecules react and atoms change positions. So you get structural information. If you're using as a technique for looking at this, uh, fluorescence on a complex molecule, you get limited amount of information because the fluorescence is, is it's a large molecule that you're looking at. If you want to get better understanding of what how the atoms move in a molecule when it's excited and when it's undergoing these other processes, you need a technique which allows you to get that structural information. And one of the te techniques we have used in, in my group has been to look at the vibrational spectroscopy of the excited electronic molecule. Uh, 
molecules vibrate, the, the atoms uh, vibrate against one another, and the frequency at which they do that is characteristic not only of what atoms you have there, but the environment in which the atoms are, the, the structure of the, of the molecule. And you can, if you're lucky, see changes in those vibrations as the molecule rearranges or passes on its energy to, to other species. So time-resolved vibrational spectroscopy opened up a whole new area of, of research. There are two ways you can do the vibrational spectroscopy. One is to use a scattering technique, technique called Raman uh, uh, spectroscopy, where you use a visible, second visible laser, which is the interrogatory laser. Uh, so you pulse the, the system with the laser which causes the excitation of a molecule, and then you interrogate with a second pulse of light from a different laser, which is trying to get this structural information. Uh, and you're using visible light, and most of the visible light is scattered at the same frequency as the incident light, and that's not terribly interesting. But some of it uh, is changed by the frequency of one of the vibrations that you have either excited or de-excited. And so that you can measure the infrared spectrum effectively of an excited electronic state which may exist for as little as 10 to the minus 12 of a second, for a picosecond. So you're working on a very fast time scale to see changes in the structure of these excited states. Subsequent to the use of time-resolved Raman spectroscopy, which is still used, it was discovered that you can get uh, an infrared spectrum that, uh, using infrared absorption as the interrogatory technique. Uh, and uh, that gives you much more detail because a, a vibration in a molecule which is infrared active is not Raman active. They're mutually exclusive, usually. So that what you can do with Raman, you cannot do with infrared and vice versa. So the two techniques are very complementary. However, you don't get all the information you need from using these, this vibrational spectroscopy. Uh, and so what you really want to be able to do is what the uh, chemists would do on the ground state of a molecule, not the excited state, not a short-lived state, and that is to use X-ray crystallography or X-ray scattering techniques and also electron scattering techniques. These have worked fantastically well on, on long-lived molecules, on ground state molecules, all of our understanding of biology, really, of biological um, structures and molecules comes from X-ray crystallography. In excited states, it's much more technically much more difficult to do because the molecule is not hanging around for very long. It's only there for, let's say, 10 to the minus 12 of a second. But that problem has been cracked. And uh, uh, Zuel in, in Caltech uh, was awarded a Nobel Prize uh, in, in the 2000s for his development of uh, electron diffraction techniques on excited states and since then x-ray techniques have been used as well. So we can get the same level of understanding of an incredibly short-lived excited state that we have on a ground state molecule uh, and that has led to uh, a, a kind of explosion of interest in the reaction dynamics of any photochemical reaction. In principle, there is no limit to the number of studies you can make on excited electronic states because a ground state molecule will absorb to uh, maybe one, two or three singlet states, different singlet states where the electron is moving to different orbitals and they will decay uh, they will decay through, op obviously, to the triplet state also. Uh, and so you have easily accessible as many as four different electronically excited states in a typical molecule. Uh, and these will undergo different reactions because the electrons, what, what determines 
chemical reactivity is where the electrons are in space. And if you move one of these electrons to different regions of space, you would expect it to behave chemically differently from its parent ground state molecule. And indeed, that is the case. So the potential for uh, ultra-fast reactions and the, uh, the reactions of electronically excited states is four or five times greater than the whole of ground state chemistry which has developed over the past couple of centuries. So we're just scratching at the surface of, uh, of what is possible. But these are very exciting times.